A good Nerev Shabbos. This Shabbos is a very special Shabbos. Every once in a while, things exceed your hopes and your dreams. On a rare occasion, the good is doubled. All through the holidays, through the high holidays and leading up to them, we prayed, we davened for good health, we prayed for a happy and sweet new year, and we prayed for simchas and happy occasions to celebrate together. Here we are now on the second Parsha of the year, not 10 days out from Simchas Torah, and on this very special week, this Shabbat, we're celebrating the upcoming marriage of two young men who grew up in our shul. Those who are regulars in the Minyan know that it can be a long period, shall we say, between one Ofrof and the next. So for us to call up two chasanim in, in one week, two grooms before their chuppahs, it's, it's more than simply a two-fold joy. It's an exponential joy for our kahila. So to both the Crickler family who celebrated Danny being called up on Thursday and to the Weiss family who's celebrating Adam's offer of this Shabbos, we extend a joyous and heartfelt mazel tov with all the blessings we know how to give. King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem uh, had several specially designated gates. That's the way Shlomo HaMelech built it. It says in Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer, there was one gate for mourners and one gate for bridegrooms. Citizens of Yerushalayim would park themselves between those two gates, and when people would come through, uh, when they would come through the mourner's gate, they would say words of consolation, just like we do in our shul on Friday night when people come uh, during Shiva, no one should ever know. The next gate was for chasanim, for bridegrooms. So when a chatan passed through that gate, people would shout out blessings. They would say, Hashochein bavayis hazeh yisamechecha bavanem uvanes which means the one, may the one who dwells in this house, in the temple, gladden you with sons and daughters. And it says they would throw sweets at them as tangible expressions of the good wishes and blessings. So you can see that the origins of our custom of honoring the groom and blessing the couple before the wedding run very deep in our history, like about 3,000 years old. Some historians connect the announcement of upcoming weddings in Shul with some legal requirements in medieval France and Germany. In other words, to clarify that bride and brides and grooms weren't already married to someone else. But we know the do, truest and deepest meaning of an ofruf, and that's why we give precedence really before all others to a groom the week before the chuppah. The, because the basis of the Jewish people surviving and thriving over those millennia, those thousands of years, is family, not federations, sorry, or shuls, sorry, or even rabbis, sorry. The basis for the Jewish people's survival and thriving over thousands of years is marriage. The covenant of marriage between two partners, which, by the way, is reflected in a marriage type of covenant between us and God. The Jewish family is the essence and the basis for Jewish life, Jewish community of the chain of tradition handed down from one generation to the next. We have Jewish communities, we have shuls, we have kehillahs, we have great centers of Jewish learning and Jewish life because these were and are built by gatherings of Jewish families. The covenant, the bond of marriage in Judaism is total and complete, it's absolute, all-encompassing, gets us through thick and thin, through good times and challenges, through all sorts of changes in the world around us. When a chasan and a kala, a bride and groom, stand together under a chuppah, signifying the home that they will build together in accordance with Jewish law and custom, that covenant is intended for life. And although we don't say all that fancy, richer and poorer stuff, we mean it all. And it's all said in one simple sentence that encompasses everything. You are made holy to me with this ring according to the laws of Moses and Israel. Those who know what goes into Jewish law, Jewish history, and Jewish life know how much word, how much weight those words carry. So for us, an ofruf is a big deal. Ofruf is the Yiddish word for calling up. By the way, this is not a sign of the patriarchy for those who are curious. The bride has her own party on Shabbat called a Shabbat Kala, Shabbos Kala. Now, out of respect for the way things are in the world, nobody throws anything at her, not even candy. Uh, but there, apparently there is plenty to eat at a Shabbos Kala party, or so I'm led to believe. And just to highlight the point, in the Sephardic world, where they don't use Yiddish so much, rather than Ofruf, they call it Shabbat Chatan. Anyway, whichever name you use to call it, we call up the groom for an aliyah in advance of the chuppah, 
as we said, he has priority over basically everyone else in the shul to get an aliyah, because we say, Chatan Dome Lamelech. Chatan Dome Lamelech, a groom, is like a sovereign. Also a quote from Pirkei the Rebbe Eliezer. The groom is coming up for an aliyah as a sign to everyone, maybe most of all to himself. The Torah, which he's going to make the blessings over, will be the guiding virtue and value, the signposts along the way, and the light that's going to shine and illuminate the path that the bride and groom will follow together as they begin their married life. They declare their honor of and loyalty toward Torah and to Jewish life, and that sets the tone for their married life together even before it begins. And then, of course, once they're married, they become a family. Of course, the decisions that they're called on to make for themselves are weighed in light of Torah and Jewish li life uh, and its importance in their lives, its centrality in their lives, where they're going to live, where to send their kids to school, where to give tzedakah, and so on. A covenant is in a particularly important part of the Torah portion of Noah, of Noah, that we're reading this week. So what better week to pick for an ofruf, the Shabbos before you get married? The story of Noah and the flood and a new beginning for humankind has as its enduring symbol the rainbow at the end of the Parsha. That rainbow is God's promise to keep faith with us forever, through thick and through thin, in sickness and in health, for rich or for poor, and never do we part. Let's still go back to the beginning and see how we got there. At the end of last week's Parsha, humankind was already getting to a not very good point. We were treating each other so poorly it actually says that God regretted having created us in the first place. The Midrashim go into great depth and detail into how badly we treated each other. Dishonesty, we lied, we cheated, we stole, took any opportunity we could to disregard the humanity, the dignity of another. It says Noah was righteous in his generation, which the commentaries say is really sort of faint praise. He was righteous compared to everyone else in those days, which really isn't saying that much. Others sing his praises, by the way. So God says to Noah that I'm going to wipe the slate clean and humankind's going to begin anew with you, with you, Noah, and your family. Noah builds the ark, takes his family, brings the animals into it where they're going to remain in lockdown with each other, only with each other, no Wi-Fi, no Netflix, no Zoom, just each other for a year. Think about that, parents, children, spouses, let your imaginations run wild with what that was like. You know how it goes, the rain falls for 40 days and 40 nights. As we know, the mystics say this was like a mikveh. A mikveh has 40 sa'ah of rainwater in it. Sa'ah is a liquid measure. So the 40 days parallel to these 40 units, 40 uh, liquid units uh, of a mikveh, suggesting that the flood of those times was less a punishment than more a cleansing and a purifying of the world, because that's what mikveh accomplishes. Now, it takes many months for the earth to dry out, right? The dove flying out, coming back with the olive branch. Remember that part of the story? So we're going to read how after a year, where it says in the fifth Aliyah, God shows Noah the sign of the covenant. God says, this is the sign of the covenant that I am giving between me and you and every living creature for everlasting generations. As kashti nasati ba'anan, I have placed my keshet, my keshet, my rainbow in the clouds. Fun fact, keshet, the rainbow, is also the initials for kehilat sha'arei Torah. Keep that one in your back pocket. So then it continues, Lois bris veini uvein ha'aretz. This will be the sign of the covenant between me and the world, says God. So the rainbow is a symbol that God remembers the covenant and always will allow us to continue. In fact, when we see a rainbow, we're supposed to think of this incident in human history and recall that no matter how low humanity sinks, and there have been some low spots, God promised never to send another flood, as happened then. We even have a bracha to say when we see a rainbow. Baracha ta Hashem, elokeinu melech olam. Blessed are you, God, sovereign of the universe. Zocher habris, you remember that covenant. V'ne'eman bevrisoi, you are faithful in your promise. V'kayam b'ma'amare, you keep your word. This is the idea of a covenant, which is symbolized by this rainbow, and it's affirmed by all the people you'll see in shul sporting bow ties this Shabbos. I should have worn a bow tie. You can't really tell what kind of tie I'm wearing at all, but whatever, should have thought of it. Uh, a covenant means that you agree to stay together through thick and thin. Sometimes things are good. And in those times, who needs a covenant? Everything's great. Everything's going well. Everyone's happy. As in the story of the flood, there are always some clouds now and again. may not be a storm. It may not be clouds. But it definitely, shall we say, gets overcast every so often. That's why we have a covenant. So that when it gets dark and it's hard to see the sun, 
we remember that God's word is with us and we gave our word to God and we always stay together. This resonates in the interpersonal realm with the covenant of marriage and the covenant of marriage in turn reflects in this relationship. We can look at relationships uh, both with other people and with God and say, well, what am I getting out of the deal? Which unfortunately is the way many people view relationships in our days. In that very reductionist view, it almost seems like a person can never be happy or satisfied because you can always say, well, they should be doing more for me. What have they done for me lately? That's one perspective on relationships. Not the only one, may not even be the best one. Another one, another perspective, in contrast, might be not what am I getting, but what can I give? What can I offer? What can I do to add, to build, to deepen this relationship? If that's our attitude, then we always have something to do. There's always something to offer, always something to give, to contribute. A smile, a kind word, a, a, a generous gesture. And then every situation has the potential for growth and strengthening the relationship. Our bracha for a chasn and kala, for a bride and groom, for Adam and Talia, for Danny and Rachel, is may you build a bayit ne'eman b'Yisrael, a faithful and everlasting home amongst the Jewish people. We all want to make the most of our lives when we enter into the covenant of marriage, that we say, I commit with all my heart, with all my soul, always to be there, always to be contributing, supportive, and faithful. That's how we build our own share of the Jewish people. We start a new Jewish family. We start a new Jewish home. Contained in the blessing is a blessing for good health, for success, which means success in the material sense. There should always be enough money and then some to pay the bills for day school tuition, good food for Shabbos, and also spiritual success, spiritual plenty. Marriage doesn't mean you stop learning and growing as a Jew and a person. Adar Abba, it's a whole new arena of growth and opportunity and hopefully the blessing of children, future generations, as they used to say in the temple thousands of years ago, may the one who dwells in this house gladden you with sons and daughters. Hashochein b'bayis hazeh yisamechacha b'vanem uvanes. Notice that we don't have to change a single word for the bracha to work in our days. When we build a Jewish home together, we hope and we pray that the blessings of children and tradition and Torah and learning and the future of the Jewish people brings all that together with it. So to, to our brides and our grooms, to their parents, their grandparents, all their families and friends celebrating with them, we wish them mazel tov, mazel tov, and truly a bayit ne'aman Yisrael. And for all of us, only more simchas, more weddings, more joyous occasions to gather in friendship and rejoicing and in good health. Mazel Tov, Shabbat Shalom.